We've talked a lot about algorithms on trees, on lists, and on graphs. When we started talking about hashing, it was interesting. We, it was our first venture into sort of numerical algorithms, where we started looking at properties of numbers and the structures of numbers. And it turns out that dealing with numbers and algorithms on numbers, uh, because numbers are so delightfully complex and interesting, there's all these amazing and wonderful algorithms we can use to deal with numbers. Some of them you've learned at a really young age. What was the first algorithm on numbers you learned? To add, even before that maybe. To count. To count, successes. You learn the given one number, what's the next? And maybe you learn given one number, what's the previous? Though that takes a little while to work out. My daughter's only just getting that now. So it's interesting, you get some things faster than others. Then you learn to add. How do you learn to add? Well, at the moment I'm saying to her things like, well, that's good, Dot, what's three plus two? And then she's counting them and she's saying it's five. But of course, I couldn't ask her, what's one nine seven one plus 5,862, I don't have enough fingers to do that. So we have to learn an algorithm on digit manipulation. And you learn that from a young age, and you just memorize it. And of course, as soon as the teacher gives you the algorithm, what comes along with the algorithm? No, no, a proof. It's the first proof you ever see. I remember I was in kindy and I got the complete proof that the addition algorithm we were using was correct. It really impressed me. And then you go on to do division and multiplication, each one of them coming along with a careful proof proving that they're correct. Has anyone ever gone through proving they're correct? I did once ask high school students in year eight, it was my favorite question, if they could prove that one and one was two, because I wasn't quite sure about it. And uh, some of them, I'm proud to say, came up with pretty damn good proofs. Uh, the best proof I ever saw was in a book called Mathematics Made Difficult. And the proof ran for about half the book, and it was really thick, and it used all sorts of abstract and higher algebra. And at the end, you triumphantly knew that one plus one was two. <laughs> I thought, oh, that was amazing. Is it assumed as true? It's assumed, no, it's not assumed as true. Like it's used as the basis to prove other No, things. addition isn't used as a basis to... No, 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 no. What is no, no, the counting, the numbers, the isomorphism between the counting numbers and cardinalities of sets is, right, you know, so is, our start, is our start. Well, the things that are assumed in arithmetic are called the piano axioms and the, and the zamello franco set axioms. And there's a couple of simple things that are assumed. And then everything flows from that. So, yeah, you can prove that one plus one is two. It's a really hard proof. And guess what? It is. <laughs> so Richard says. <laughs> so I hope you've learned skepticism. So, there are all sorts of interesting algorithms we learn dealing with numbers, and Nuth devotes volume two of his three-volume um, uh, set of four books on algorithms to semi-numerical algorithms. And by that, he means algorithms on numbers. So, I thought I might give you some algorithms on numbers just to start thinking about algorithms on numbers. So, here's one of the early ones I learned. Uh, well, we've seen this one. 3 plus 2. That's an easy algorithm. You can work out addition of numbers up to 5 and numbers up plus numbers up to 5 by just using counting, using your fingers. But I said adding bigger numbers, we, run, we don't have enough fingers. But actually, can I add up, can I represent more than 5 numbers on these 5 fingers? Each finger could be up or down, say. Representing a bit, that would let me count up to what? 32. 32. Let's try it. Wait till we get to four. <laughs> four, five, uh, six, seven. <laughs> Terrible at counting. Okay, so we could do that. And I guess if I could angle my fingers, I could even get base three in there or something like that, so we could squeeze a bit more. So how much information have we got in our fingers? Do we have enough information to learn multiplication? Because I could never memorize things, and sadly that's how my education worked. It was a memorization education. So I could never do my tables. Is there anyone here that knows their tables? Great respect from me if anyone here knows their multiplication tables. I still don't know mine. So I learned an algorithm to do multiplication, and it was on my fingers. So I thought I'd show you that algorithm today. Shh, 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 shh. Here's how it goes. If you want to multiply, well, let's think. How much information have I got on my fingers? Have I got 10 bits? I could represent 1,000 things, I guess, 1,000 numbers. But the, the um, encoding might be hard, uh, decoding them, given the states. Um, because I was a little kid and I wasn't very dexterous, let's just say all I'm allowed to do is touch fingers together. Fingers on one hand can touch fingers on the other. And let's suppose I'll just touch two. 
one on one hand touching one on the other. How, many, how much information have I got there? How many different sums can I represent? 25, that's right. Five fingers on this hand, five on this hand, so there's 25 ways of touching them. So the numbers, I could learn my one, two, three, four, five table. It was my six, seven, eight, nines that were a problem. And we had to learn 11, 12s. Did you guys have to learn 11, 12s? Why? What's going on there? It's crazy. So we know how many shillings are in a pound, I guess, or something crazy like that. All the algorithms I learned from then only required me to know the ones up to 10, up to nine. So here's how we go. Shh, 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 shh. Let's assume we know the ones one to five, and our only problems are the six to tens. How many, um, how many products are there of numbers six to 10 by numbers six to 10? How many equations is that? How many results do I have to learn? Well, how many numbers are there six to 10? Five, how many times five? Let's suppose I don't know the symmetry. I don't know multiplication commutes. 25, aha, we've got a match. So here's how it works. This is six, this is seven, this is eight, this is nine, this is 10. This is six, this is seven, this is eight, this is nine, this is 10. So I'm gonna multiply, give me, an, uh, give me the hard one. Give me six times seven, I can never do that. <laughs> give me any hard, as hard as you want. I can solve it now. Go on. Seven times eight. So I get my seven finger and my eight finger and I join them together. And they and everything below them are all worth 10. So that's one, two, three, four, five. It's 50 something. And I multiply the numbers on the top because I know how to do my small multiplications. Two times three, six, 56. How about that? Oh, uh, all credit goes to my wonderful grandfather who's a mathematician. My grandfather is so wonderful that even mentioning his name causes a universe stuff. <laughs> I've turned it to zero. I don't know where the sound's coming from. We're on zero on everything. <laughs> I'm turning the lights down. I'm turning the air conditioning down. There's nothing left turned on. Oh my God. <laughs> um, so. I've given you an algorithm, your job now is prove it's correct, okay. If this works, you could speed up com your computer by enormous amounts, by the way. No one else knows this little secret for speeding things up. So I thought I'd give you some more numeric algorithms. Let's look at some. One of the um, fun things we had to do with hashing was we discovered that primes were really interesting. If we folded primes into our hash algorithms, and I know some of you have been experimenting with hash algorithms for um, the Browning questions, trying to make them as good as possible. You, you have probably found that for your hash function to be good, it has to sort of simulate randomness. And there's order hiding everywhere in the number system. But the seeds of randomness, if you've got multiplication, are the prime numbers. If, you, um, if numbers divide into each other, things aren't very interesting. If I have a clock with 12 states in it, and my randomizing algorithm is advance four hours, you can see that's not a very interesting advancing algorithm. Advance four hours, advance four hours, advance four hours, advance four hours, advance four more hours, where am I now? I'm back where I started. So if I've got 12 things, four's no use. What else is no use? Three, two, six. <laughs> One. One's no use for a different reason. Yeah, so essentially, numbers that are not co-prime to my base they don't introduce enough randomness. The, the length of the cycle they generate by something called Lagrange's theorem won't be the maximum possible length. Numbers that are relatively, uh, have no factors in common, which we call co-prime, um, uh, generate much more randomness, longer cycles, crazy behavior. And if numbers are guaranteed to be co-prime if they're both prime, so it's very convenient to pick primes often because you know they're not gonna divide into each other because they can't unless they're the same number, which would be bad luck. Okay, so we love prime numbers, and there's lots of interesting results involving prime numbers and fun things we do in computing involving prime numbers. But um, in fact, most modern cryptography is based on prime numbers to one way or another, we'll see shortly. But the problem is then, how do we know a number's prime? How can we tell if we've got a number and we wanna know it's prime? What's our strategy? I'm, I need a, a prime number 13. I know that's prime because I've memorized the first however many prime numbers. Four of them, <laughs> whatever, six. But 
the number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Is that prime? I mean, no one could tell. You couldn't just memorize that. I mean, oh, it's not. How do you know it's not? Oh, it ends in eight. Okay. And now, what did that tell you? It's divisible by two. It's divisible by two. In fact, it ended in seventy-eight, so it's not divisible by four, and so on. Okay. So we know some tests. And you probably know a test to know if a number is divisible by 3, and you probably know a test to know if a number is divisible by 10, and you probably know a test to know if a number is divisible by 5 or 9. So. Or, or you know a test for divisible by 7? I think so. Tell me after the lecture, and I will be your friend forever. So, um, so we know some tests, but you can see if I want to test the number's prime, it's not only going to be not divisible by 2, it's going to be not divisible by 3, not divisible by everything. So I can't be, and I can't know a million different crazy tests. So what's a systematic way I can use to work out if a number's prime or not? One thing is I could go through all the factors of the numbers, all the possible factors, and see if they divide evenly in. But that's quite time consuming, because the number of factors is very large. What's the number I have to stop testing at? The square root of n. So I've got to test a sec effectively everything one all the way up to the square root of n. If you're clever, you'll just do the primes in this range. But nonetheless, there's an awful lot of them. And that grows really fast as n grows. As the number of bits in n grows slowly, this grows really big. So algorithms to check if something's prime by a brute force approach take so long to run that they're infeasible for really large numbers, like a thousand digit number. You would never run, never run a brute force on that, forget it. hundred digit number maybe. So we need a faster way to tell if numbers are prime or not if we really want to have big primes. And we do really want to have big primes. So here's an interesting result. Uh, does anyone have a calculator here? I'm going to just amaze you with my mental powers. Doo -doo -doo -doo. You're getting a calculator out. Wave at me. You've got one already? All right. Can you ca how many digits have you got? Eight or nine. Oh, we might not be able to do it, but let's try. What is uh, three? To the six minus well, no, three to the six mod seven. Any marks? Get set, go. Yes, it's one. See? Calculator worked it out. Like Blackboard worked it out. Yes, it's one. But someone work it out and double check. It's one. Oh, you calculate your computer did work it out. Oh, you really who called out one, you used computers, did you? Did anyone use their heads? Oh, okay. All right. What is um, 16 to the oh, 16 to the 6? Six, 16 to the 6. Can you do that? Mod 7. 1. Yes. It's 1. In fact, What's any number in the whole entire universe, except seven, or any multiple of seven, which I'll call A, standing for any number in the whole entire universe except seven or a multiple of seven, to the power of six mod seven. It's one. In fact, has anyone heard of Fermat? Fermat's a little theorem which we write FLT to distinguish it from Fermat's last theorem. Fermat's little theorem goes like this. Pick any number you want. Raise it to a prime minus one. Mod it by the prime. And as long as that any number you want wasn't actually a multiple of p, or p itself, this will always be equal to one. So what's a really big prime? Is a thousand and one prime? Does anyone know? No, it's not? Yeah, that's 11. It's divisible by 11. 1,100 is divisible by 11, so if we subtract 99, okay. 1,003. Let's say it's a prime. Let's say if it was prime, then 2 to the 1,002 mod 1,003 would be equal to 1. Can you work out what it is? It's 990. Ah, what does that tell us? 1,003 is not prime. 
Does that make sense? If it were prime, Fermat's little theorem tells us this would be equal to one, but actually it's equal to 990 something. It's not equal to it. So what about, oh, using Haskell? Python. Python, yeah. <laughs> What about, what's um, two, what's another potential prime number? One, 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 one. What do you think? That's Looks a bit five. suspicious. That's definitely 11, isn't it? <laughs> Three, that's no good. Seven. Oh, oh, six. Mod one, 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 seven. What's that? One. Okay. So, it's this amazing result. Now, can you see, if the number is prime, we'll always get one. And if we get a number that's not one, what does that tell us? It's not prime. Does that mean this is a perfect way of spotting primes? No. 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 What's the problem we've got? That's a very big number. If it be a number, you know. Now, what's the problem? Uh, it's a big number, so it's hard to, it takes a lot of work to raise two to that power, or a really big power. Yeah, yeah, okay. It's hard to exponentiate something to a really big power. It takes a lot of time. We'll look at how to speed that up in a sec. And then we're going to mod it by a number. That takes a lot of work. But it, even more fundamentally, what's the problem? You've got to make sure they're not multiples of each other. Though you can do that in instant by dividing. Yep. Are there instances where you get one? Ah, <laughs> Nicholas, Nicholas, my man, he's got it. Sometimes it's possible that this is true even if this isn't prime. It's certainly always true when it's prime, but sometimes it's true for composites. And the composites for which it's true are called pseudo primes. And there's some of them around. So if you get a non one, you know it's composite. But if you get a one, you're not quite sure. You think it's probably prime. The chances are it's prime. There's not many pseudo primes around. What ratio are they in? What ratio are they in? Well, that's an interesting question. I'm glad you asked that. If, if you, oh, no, I've got to make sure I don't get confused with miller rabin If you change the base, Something that's a pseudo prime to the base two is very unlikely to be a pseudo prime to any other base. So if you just tried it to a few different bases and you kept getting ones, you'd start to feel quite confident. But sadly, there are some numbers which are pseudo prime to every base, called the Carmichael numbers, because uh, they muck up prime testing completely. The smallest Carmichael number being 561, the next Carmichael number being something like 11 something. The next one after that, that's homework for you. So, 1117, is it? No, no. no. <laughs> if it was 1117, that would be very funny. So it's clearly not. Yeah. Okay. Um, so this is an interesting algorithm. Here we've got an algorithm now that after we've run it, if it says the number we're looking at is composite, we know it's right. But if it says the number we're looking at is prime, it might be right or it might be wrong. It's a probabilistic algorithm. It's a probabilistic algorithm. The nice thing about it is we can iterate it over a range of bases and it's probably okay. The problem is there are, you asked what's the distribution. The problem is it's not even the density of the distribution that's a problem. The problem is there are some numbers which are just pathological, we can't distinguish the difference between. Luckily, the frequency of Carmichael numbers is very, very low. Like it's one, once you get to really big numbers, they're, you know, one in a billion or something like that. The chance of hitting one are very low. So, for example, SSL, what you use for secure web, I'm just, just double checking, is it SSL? Oh. No, I don't think it's SSL. Oh, now I'm suddenly not sure. Might be PGP. Anyway, some co I've, I've gone blank on which one it is that actually relies on this primality testing this way. There are fancier tests, a modified version of this called the Miller-Rabin test, which you could look up, which do a, f a few uh, fancy little tweaks. The nice thing about the Miller-Rabin test is exactly the same as the Fermat's little theorem test, except there's no pathological cases, and you're guaranteed to correctly identify them with probability at least three on four every time. So the chance of it making a mistake any time is guaranteed to be, to be less than one on four, and often much, much less. So now once we've got this guarantee that no matter what base we pick, the chance of it giving us the wrong answer is one, uh, no more than a quarter, what does this let us do? Pick four, and then it'll be... Repeat it. And if we repeat it 10 times, 
the chance of it tricking all those tests is 1 on 4 to the 10, which is 1 on 2 to the 20, which is 1 in a million. That's not good enough for you? Do it 20 times. Do it 30 times. Do it 40 times. Do it 100 times. You repeat this 100 times, the chance of it accidentally being wrong is massively smaller than the chance that a cosmic ray particle is going to come in and go hit inside your computer and change memory locations and, 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 and the computer's just going to randomly make a wrong execution step anyway. So here's an algorithm that's not guaranteed to be correct. This just probabilistically converges on being correct. Yes, then there was another hand. Yes? Well, if you can't repeat the test, then you could all then use as a trigger to do a more expensive test, ah. which is guaranteed to be right. You could do a more expensive test. Um, unfortunately, we have no... Uh, the expense of all these tests is about the same, and then the next thing down is uh, horrendously expensive. If it, absolutely has to be if it absolutely has to be correct, then you can't use a probabilistic algorithm. But I claim if something absolutely has to be correct, and the chance of it not being correct is I can make as, as small as I want, I'm going to claim that at the limit this is absolutely correct. What's, can you think of a single scenario where you'd need it to be absolutely correct and the chance, and the chance of it being wrong being one in a Google is, you know, is unacceptable? Because before that one in a Google thing happens, spontaneously air molecules by Brownian motion will assemble and form a figure of God who will cast a spell to make the whole laws of the universe change. That's probably more likely than one in a Google. I mean, that happens all the time, actually. But, um, so, okay. so really, we're straining at gnats. But yeah, if it absolutely had to be correct, I'd go back and redefine the problem. <laughs> because why not Google? That's pretty damn good, I reckon. Now, there was another question. Shh, yeah. The same question, which was, just remind me. Yes. Yes, that's why I thought I'd introduce it in this lecture. Uh, it's this nice contrast. I've been going on and on and on about correctness. And I thought it would be funny, like a palate cleanser, to give you an algorithm that can never be completely correct. It's sort of funny. But can you see that from an engineering point of view, or even any point of view, uh, what well, you could argue near enough is good enough in this case. Um, there are proofs in mathematics that are probabilistic proofs. Like, for example, you probably know the four-color map problem. When I was a wee lad, that was an unsolved problem. And then, a while ago, someone solved it by exhaustive enumeration on a TRS-80 or some crappy computer like that. They just enumerated all possible cases. There were like a thousand cases they had to check. And then they printed out the thing at the end on the printer, on their little crappy printer from 50 years ago. Checking case number one, checking case number two. And at the end, it checked all thousand cases. It said, all cases passed. You are awesome. And was that an acceptable proof? Because the chance of there being an error, there's a chance there's an error in the program. A computer did the proof, not a person. Maybe the program wasn't right. Maybe the computer made a, a misstep. You know, we have to sort of take that on proof. So the notion of what is proof is an interesting thing. OK, so um, probabilistic algorithms, though, are very delightful, and we'll see more as we go on. And they're very exciting when you, can, when you have a context that can use them. Now, the reason I thought I'd like to show you prime numbers and Miller-Rabin and things like that, is there's this really cool thing we can do with them that you might be interested in in your project. Because in your project, you can communicate with each other, but the problem is the bad guys can hear what you're saying. So you can plot against them, but the problem is they can hear what you're saying. This is exactly how the internet works. You can do anything you want on the internet, but the problem is everyone can hear everything you do. So if you want to do anything secure, like give you my credit card number, I've got a problem. How can I give him my credit card number? I can encrypt it. Yeah, but how can I encrypt it? Like, I encrypt it, I send it to him. How does he decrypt it? How does he get the key? He's in America. I've just bought some. He's Amazon. He doesn't know my key. I post him my key. <laughs> the problem is, in all these situations where you want to have confidentiality, we want to create some form of asymmetry. So an attacker is different to the intended recipient. If the, attacker, if the intended recipient knows nothing at the start of my communication with him, and an attacker knows nothing at the start of the communication, then they're on equal footing. There's nothing I can do that, that he can understand that the attacker can't understand. Because so I have to have a shared secret up front. It's really hard to do that. Actually, there is this cool way of creating shared secrets out of nothing, which I might show you super fast, just in one second, called Diffie-Hellman, which is quite amazing. 
here's how it goes. I'm not suggesting you do this in the assignment, though you're welcome to, because we're actually giving you one round of communication which the tutors can't listen to. So you can pre-share secrets in that round if you want. Um, your first messages and the, the Dracula can never hear. But if we didn't do that, you could use Diffie-Hellman. Here's how Diffie-Hellman works. It's a very clever algorithm. I think of some, have I already told you Diffie-Hellman? I think of a clever, I think of a, we agree on some number, the base. Maybe it's 52 or something. 50, maybe make it prime, 53. We each know the base. I say it publicly, I'm talking to you. Hey, 52, no, I'm going to talk to someone a long way away so everyone can hear. Right in the far corner. 53, okay, we're going to be using 53. I don't want anyone here to understand what we're saying, so we're going to encrypt it, and in encrypting it, I'm going to need to use 53. So, so far, you're hearing exactly what he's hearing. And you go, okay. And then I pick a random number, randomness, you've got to love it. Maybe I pick my random number is 7. And I compute 53 to the 7, and then I'm going to mod that by something. Maybe I mod that by 1,017. Oh, by the way, I'm going to mod it by 1,017. Can you do the same? Just pick a random number, raise 53 to your random number, don't tell me what it is, suppose it's, oh, <laughs> something, and then you mod it by 1117, alright, what did you get, what's your answer? You can make it up, no it's you, the guy in the blue shirt, uh, uh, 10. 10, okay. I got 951. Now, you see, you've all heard everything. But there's, some, there's an asymmetry now created. How is he different to you? Yeah, yeah, he knows that, you don't know it. So here's what we both do. I take his number and I raise it to the seven. He takes my number and he raises it to the question mark. And then we mod it again. And at the end, what do we have? Well, I have 53 to the 7. Sorry, I have uh, his number, which is 53 to the question mark, and then I raise that to the 7. What's 53 to the question mark to the 7? 53 to the 7 times question mark. He computes what I sent him, which was 951 to the question mark. So he computes 53 to the 7, 951, to the question mark, to the question mark. He raised it to his question mark, which equals 53 to the 7 times question mark. We've both computed the same value. And suppose that is, after modding by 1011, suppose that's 42. We both now know 42. We've worked out a secret key. No one listening to this knows that key. We now, that number you worked out just then, let's use that as our key, okay? Is it 42, by the way? <laughs> Good, just checking. Okay, so this works because raising something to a power is easy to do, but going back the other way, given the answer, is hard to do. It's another example of this thing we've been talking about called a one-way function. What one-way function, can you think of another common one-way function, something that's easy to do one way? and hard to do the other way. That's a common mathematical operation. Multiplying numbers. If I do, dividing's hard. I don't know why, it's really hard. Multiplying's easy. So, if I computed 9731 times 8624, that's not gonna take me long to do. It's just a small number of operations. You know, at most it's 16, it's probably heaps less, isn't it? And I work out whatever number that is. If I said, given this number, find its factors, that's a hard problem. We know some specific tricks for doing that that work in some cases, but we don't know how to do it generally. Now, what would happen if I pick this one to be a prime and this one to be a prime? Multiplying two primes is easy. Gives me an enormous big number. I ask you to factorize it. How many factors has it got? It's just got those two. How are you going to find those factors? Divide by one of them. Divide by, if you're lucky enough to find one of them, you can get the other. But finding one of them is brute force or pretty close to it. We don't know a good way of factoring. This is another one-way function. And in fact, RSA, the amazing RSA encryption algorithm is based on exactly this. That I can multiply two primes together 
and I'll make them big. I'll give them 100 digits. I'll have them 200 digits. A 200 digit prime times a 200 digit prime gives me a 400 digit product. I can tell the world the 400 digit product and you are doomed. <laughs> Given enough time and the universe lasting long enough, you can brute force factorize it, but there's no way you can do it quickly. Yet I can go the other way in one second, less than one second multiplication. So RSA and lots of clever cryptographic techniques are based, on, well, most cryptography is based on one-way function, and RSA is in particular based on the difficulty of factoring. And if anyone here ever worked out a way of factoring really quickly, RSA and the internet would fail. Now here's what I wanted to show you. We've only got seconds, 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 seconds. A numeric algorithm, shh, it's gonna go so fast. Someone said raising something to a power was hard. If I wanted to calculate 57 to the uh, 17, if I had to multiply 57 times 57 times 57 times 57, that's gonna take me 17 steps. That's a long time, shh, shh, shh. Because if I wanted to calculate 57 to a 100 digit number, I'm gonna to have to do a Google steps. And that's obviously not gonna work in the time of the universe. So if I wanna be able to raise something to a big number, I need to have a faster way of doing it. And lo and behold, we have one. It's a very, very clever technique. Let me show you how to do it with 17. What's 17 equal to, by the way? It's equal to 16 plus one. So that's 57 to the 16 plus one. I'm a computer scientist, so I love powers of two. So I always like breaking things into powers of two. Really, what we're saying when we say that is that it's, it's decimal, it's binary recimentation, something like, tell me how many zeros have I got? Too many already? Is that it? Is that 17? If you write 17 in binary, wherever there's a one, is a power of two in its sum. Does that make sense? I need another zero? Thank you. Is that looking good? Okay. So how can I compute it? Rather than multiplying 57 17 times, here's what I can do. I can just do 57, that's 57 to the one. And then if I square it, what does that give me? Which is to the power of two. And if I square that, what does that give me? And if I square that, what does that give me? And if I square that, what does that give me? So I'm gonna take 57, I'm gonna square it, square that, square that, square that. How many time multiplications have I done? One multiplication, two multiplications, three multiplications, four multiplications, and then how am I gonna get 50, 57 to the 17 from these? I'm gonna multiply that by that. Because 57 to the one times 57 to the 16 equals 57, <laughs> equals in Latvia, in, no, in somewhere, somewhere that writes digits the other way around. So it only took me one, two, three, four, five multiplications to calculate this rather than 17 of them. And in general, the number of multiplications you have to do is only as many, um, is in the same order as the number of bits in the representation. So if you've got um, a number with 100 digits in it, then that's roughly, what, two to the 300. So you're gonna have to do something like 300 multiplications to work it out. You're not gonna have to do a Google multiplications to work it out. That's clever. So that's our lab question this week, to make a fast mod expert. Because if we get this working, modular exponentiation, raising it to big powers, if we get that working, you better use it next week to do RSA. And that's uber uncrackable cryptography. Okay. So good luck, everyone. And I'll see you in two days. <laughs>